from MIT's Office of Digital Learning. This is Climate Conversations by ClimateX. I'm your host, Rajesh Kasturirangan. Welcome to Climate Conversations. I'm Rajesh Kasturirangan. I am the resident Grinch for today. And I'm his, one of his partners in crime, Dave Damlore. Glad to be here. And Kurt Newton. Uh, I think I'd like to be, I'd like to be the dog, the little dog. Wait, what's, you mean like, <laughs> is it an arf arf? Or what? <laughs> yeah. Wolf, you wolf. know, the one who stands on the edge of the sled. We're talking about the Grinch. Yes. The Grinch stole Christmas, yes. right? Oh, yes, yes. 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 Okay. Let's jump right into it. We have a wonderful opportunity today. We've been thinking for a while that we need to, you know, once every few episodes, just take stock of what's happening and where we are going. And we got an opportunity to do that this time. So we wanted to, uh, you know, share with you all a little bit more about where we're coming from, what our what our biases coming into this uh, climate change conversation happen to be, because uh, Lord knows we've all got them. Well, uh, and and we're also take I the think... gloves off a little bit. We're going to interrupt each other more than we used to, <laughs> like I just did. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm going to start with a pet peeve. Remember, I'm the Grinch, yeah, yeah. and my pet peeve is for the day, since I have one every day, I think, uh, <laughs> is the term stakeholder. Can I tell you how much I hate it? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Where I see it used a lot is in policy making circles, as in we should bring all the stakeholders together, except well, that one of those stakeholders is a humongous corporation and another stakeholder is some poor farmer. So I was just wondering, what does this have to do with climate change, Rajesh? You, you've, you've told us, yeah. It's got everything to do with climate change because I think that in many policymaking circles where people use, say, ExxonMobil as a stakeholder and contrast them with some you know, community, let's say, in Haiti. We're all stakeholders. Or yes. We're all stakeholders, yeah. but we're not. It's not yeah. equal. Let's yeah, put it that way. Exactly. Stakeholder is a, is a leveling, right? It's a yes. to sort of level it out. Yes. Yeah. Some of them have a steak skyscraper, and the others have just a steak stick. In the dirt. <laughs> Can you give me a specific yeah. example that particularly tees you off? Oh. Um, Where you thought this is an egregious difference in power position, and you know this is really just window dressing. Let's see who. How many people, let's see if here. I can really offend someone. <laughs> um, Dakota Access Pipeline. Yeah. Exactly. I don't know. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't want to put no, words in your no, mouth. No, go but, ahead. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah. I bet you that if you, if we took a few minutes to go on Google and see how, say, the Dakota Access Pipeline is formulated, right? It will say, "Oh, we yeah. intend to, you know, bring all stakeholders together." Yeah. Well, th so and and the the legal framework that allowed Dakota Access Pipeline to to go ahead requires all of these meetings that have to happen, right? We've heard all the stakeholders, but then there's absolutely nothing that says you have to do anything with what you've, quote, heard from the stakeholders. So is that at the yeah. root of, of the frustration there? Yeah. So Something what's like the that. fix? How do you make that different? You're not going to tell people they can't use the word or they're in prison. Oh, come on. We're just venting right now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I, I, I feel like there is no easy fix. Changing language use is a hard problem. Mm, that's for sure. Right. Well, but and, and it's and it's all too easy to just change the language, but not change the underlying situation. Right? Oh, I you, wish you, you you paper over what's actually going on with. Right. Oh, we changed the term, and and we can kid ourselves that oh, we're we're behaving differently. Yeah. Yeah. So, having said that, <laughs> now <Yeah>. you know, <laughs> Rajesh, why does a particular word get you so upset? Where does that come from? You know, what what was going on in your in your younger years that uh, that would bring you to mm. to this sort of responses? I just I think I'm very particular about le words. Yeah. That's it, and, yeah. and I feel like I use words precisely. Maybe it's my training as a mathematician. Uh -huh. I think that using words to mean exactly what you want them to mean and not something else is something I find important. I'm yeah. guessing that there's also, I'm hearing in what you were saying earlier, oh, a pretty strong feeling about power differences and that language is a way to express those. And yes. that you would maybe suggest that there ought to be a little more equality in the conversations about uh, energy and 
all that sort of stuff. I agree. Except when I like to be king. No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, Dave, Dave, I want to ask you. I don't want to be a stakeholder. I want to just be the holder. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah. You want to call yeah. the shots. Yeah. yeah. Well, ahead. stakeholder certainly expresses that there are a whole bunch of people who have claim to a shared something. And yes. uh, sometimes that's hard to, uh, hard to accept. I mean, Dave, you, you have a, a, a planning background, right? And that's, that's a place where I think the concept of stakeholders and bringing stakeholders together, you know, really plays out very strongly. Um, right. Are, are you a fan of the stakeholder concept? I want to see you push back on Rajesh a little bit here. Yes. I'm not sure that's possible. Fight, fight, <laughs> fight, fight, fight. <laughs> no, I was thinking uh, it can't. It's it can go either way, is my experience. So it can be papering over differences. Uh, treating everybody as theoretically equal and everybody's got a stake in this. But in fact, there are proportions of stakes and power positions that you have to acknowledge. So my interest is in getting the conflicts surfaced out on the table in a way that they're discussable. So right. that's the key. Right. So in my, I've had uh, many years of professional experience in trying to bring folks together around a common interest and obviously, in almost every ca single case, uh, there are some folks that have more power, more money, more wealth, more something or other to influence the outcome. But my observation is that if you can get folks together in a room and see each other as human beings who ha share an interest in a possible uh, outcome, then it makes a significant difference. Yeah, I'll reflect on some of the recent experiences, the successes of a group like Mothers Out Front, who it's, it's a very effective grassroots driven community that has taken on <laughs> some of the challenges with, for instance, the natural gas system and utility companies that are absolutely have a, have a lot of power politically and financially. And they've been able to sort of come to the table and work with them in a way that seems to be having some good results. I, it could be fantastic if we can get uh, somebody with Mothers Out Front Connections to come in on a future podcast and tell yeah. us a little bit more about how how they managed to pull that off. We do know a few of them. And, uh, yes. Let's uh, see if we can and, and I want to tag on to what you just yeah. said, Kurt. I think one of the things that I take away from observing and listening to folks in Mothers Out Front is they place an enormous value on relationships with the utilities, with state regulators, with all sorts of people, and it would be very easy, I think, for us all uh, to slide into we, them, we, they kind of um, yeah. Stop yelling conversation. at them. Yeah. Right, yeah. and that uh, they're human beings, they may have a lot more power and wealth than we do, but they do listen and uh, sometimes take things personally. So building that relationship is what I observe yeah. Mothers Out Front to be doing yeah. very uh, systematically and consciously. It really brings me like, you know, a conflict that I am feeling more acutely as the days go, which is on the one hand, you want to say everybody's equal, we're all at the same table, right? That's a principle. Right. But at the same time, you absolutely want to acknowledge that different parties come to that table with very, very different levels of access to resources, to decision making. So how do we do both? Because, you know, there is a principle of equality, but there should also be simultaneously a principle of difference. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And acknowledging and it as real yeah. and exist existing and yeah, not because hypothetical. because we are not living in an ideal world, and we have to acknowledge that. I think. And I think if um, you have a closer look at what uh, Professor Larry Suskind and Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT has been doing over the years. See our recent video on Climate X. Right. Hey, the plug just right. went up. Yep. Larry, Good interview with him. Yeah, exactly. And uh, he and uh, his colleagues in the Department of Urban Studies, as well as uh, other units in which he's involved, have done a fabulous job of bringing people together and doing just, Rajesh, just what you were suggesting, of making the conflict visible and talking about it. And he's done uh, amazing work recently with coastal communities in bringing the different- Stakeholders. The evil word, the stakeholders <laughs> together. Beep. <laughs> <laughs> 
so that you can reach um, a conclusion or some policy recommendation that really um, reflects that deep listening of all the different parties. Okay, I got to tell you about a fan, like you asked how to solve this language problem. I do actually have an answer, which I, which at that time I found, you know, side-splittingly funny. And I, I mean, I was a teenager, and I read Gore Vidal's Myra Breckenridge, in which he replaced all the four-letter words that we will not name right now with the names of Supreme Court justices. <laughs> <laughs> right, so people got burgered and right, uh, right. Warren, and, <laughs> right, and it was so funny because it did exactly that, right? It replaced something that is a, you know, a curse word right. with the name of someone with enormous power. Yes, and and I felt that it was such. I mean, it was perhaps more clever than profound, but yeah, you know, when you're 19, you find that very very funny. Is that a novel or a short story? It is a novel. Yes. It is okay. a novel. Yeah. To be continued, yeah. To be continued. All right, so could. I would like to put a topic on the table that we have not really touched on a whole lot, uh, either in the posts or on the ClimateX website or here in these conversations, and that's transportation. Mm-hmm. I know a thing or two about Take that, us there. Ha- having worked for the federal government in the USDOT. And I'm really struck by the conversations that are happening around electric vehicles these days. Have you guys seen any of those? Which ones do you have in mind? Which conversations? Well, I'm thinking they're the Bloomberg Energy Financial Network, or whatever it's called, put out a report the other day that says, contrary to earlier projections, it looks like in 2040 that electric vehicles will make up the majority of vehicles that are sold in the United States, at least. Yeah, I'd like to take uh, Michael Bloomberg at his, at his word there. You know, there was also uh, recent news from Volvo announcing that in two years, I think it is? Yeah, 2019. Yeah, that's right. They will stop making petrol-based, pure, purely petrol-based engines. Did you see is, what that did to Tesla stock? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll probably bounce back. <laughs> and I'd love, you know, to have an announcement like that coming from some of the bigger automakers as well. But it, it's a, it's an interesting sort of momentum-building situation. Uh, mm-hmm. certainly, a, certainly a promising thing. Can you imagine, thing. like, a yeah. Toyota just saying, that's what we will do? Yeah. I mean, that would... Yeah. It could happen. I mean, so, that, you know... So... So there are a lot of things in play here. In in the spirit of taking the gloves off here, since we're talking about electric vehicles, you know, one of the things that's been in the back of my mind in all the renewable energy conversations and and projecting forward to all this storage that we're going to need, you know, it was brought to my attention about a year ago through a pair of stories in the Washington Post, kind of horrifying environmental and cultural consequences of where lithium and cobalt are being mined. And I don't think Bolivia, for example, uh, and the Congo. Yep. Yeah, there's a, there's a pair of articles. I'm gonna I'll, I'll dig out and we'll put links uh, yeah. to those on our website. People have no idea how horrifying the mining situation is and what happens in the in the communities where these minerals are being extracted. Absolutely. And Congo serious civil and to, war. And yeah. to build out the storage infrastructure, you know, a thousand fold, ten thousand fold from the amount of uh, minerals that are being extracted right now. We got to watch out, and we got to, you know, as a as a world, kind of jump in and figure out a more equitable equitable way, because the stuff ain't free. Yeah, that's know, for sure. It comes at a real cost. And but, and yeah, yeah. E- and you know, when we talk about renewables, yeah. So I want to sort of add to that with two. So I got my first instance, you could say, as a student, of being environmentally active was a protest movement against a huge series of dams in Western India. Yeah. And if you now read about, like hydropower is now the good guy, right? It's renewable energy. But actually, historically, it's been one of the most anti, um, one of the most unequal forms of uh, development. Certainly, if you look in China, the, what, Three Gorges? Three Gorges, like who is... Well, that was the case. Who's you the know, recipient of 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 that uh, flooding? Exactly. <laughs> happens. Yeah. In fact, and that connects us back to Dakota Access Pipeline. You know, somebody should f- should fact check me on this, but my understanding is that that particular tribe, that reservation, that community, 
50 or 100 years ago was basically kicked off of their agricultural land when a dam was built just on the outside of their reservation. You know, the legacy of basically being forced off of their off of their land, forced to to try to farm in way, way substandard other places because the Army Corps of Engineers decided they needed to build a dam. They were stakeholders. They were ignored. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think that that has been the history of large dam making. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so let's uh, let's talk for a minute about individual action then, because you know I was just thinking about my my home electric service here in Massachusetts. I get it from a, an organization called Mass Energy, and one of the things that I try to do to be a good climate citizen is is tell people how easy it is to to green up your energy supply. I can't put solar panels on my roof, but hey, it's great. I can get get this stuff from somebody else, and I'm currently getting you know one of their renewable portfolios that's actually three quarters hydro. From Quebec, uh, most likely up north. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, and there's a and there's a service that's a little more expensive. That's 100 percent wind. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. I, sh- I, I should I should check myself on that. Yeah. Think about you know. You know. I, there you may know. be some nuclear in the mix as well. No nuclear. No yeah. nuclear. Yeah. Uh-huh. I yeah. mean, I I, yeah. f- I feel like we can't let other forms of injustices slide just because they meet some renewable, yeah. like some label that we currently hey, find man, attractive. get off my back. It <laughs> says it's green. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, I feel like we need two kind of additional senses. One is for what kind, what is the actual impact of the so-called green energy? Like who is it? I mean, energy has to be extracted from something somewhere. Right, and the other is what are the numbers? <laughs> I feel like we need kind of both the moral and the mathematical calculus yeah. somewhere in this. I wanted to ask you guys what are there a couple things that come to mind when you think about individual personal actions that you've been taking lately that you feel good about? Uh, I walk a lot more uh, rather than get in my car. Yep. Yeah. Individual actions. I. I think what I've been doing more of, which I'm actually happiest about, is talking to my daughter more. Yeah. Not just about specificities, but, you know, how to, like, her views actually teach me, like, well. Kids are amazing at pointing out the BS, you know. Exactly, there's that. The fairness meter is Yes. and also the clarity meter. You know, I, what yeah. is that you just said? <laughs> and, and, and I think... Yeah. How old's your daughter? 11. Yeah. And I feel like by being... I mean, there is the professorial side of me that wants to teach my daughter. Never happens. Yeah. Right? And, and I think that that's great. And at the same time, I feel like being able to see the world from her point of view, invaluable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. What about you, Kurt? What yeah, individual okay. actions pop up for you? Well, uh, I've been thinking about my kids a lot, too, actually. They're, uh, they're a little older, um, 18 and 20, if I calculated that right. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, I've, I've been trying to, and it's, it's actually pretty easy. They, they get it, right? They get it, that the actions that you take every day actually, actually are important. So, you know, it's pretty easy to get them to think about, you know, can I bike where I need to get to? Or do I need to drive? You know some of the bigger picture things about, hey, let's let's get involved in our community and push our legislators. Uh, and I've been starting to do that recently, and and that's actually been really really interesting, really really gratifying. I've been to the state house a couple times. I'm going again in a, in, a, in a few days, and having having that sort of contact with the people who are in these different positions of power and authority, and having your voice be heard. I've been trying to to share with them uh, what what it's been like. And and they seem they seem genuinely interested. I would uh, I would love it if they uh, start to come along. That's great. Yeah. yeah. So you're putting your body where yeah. your heart is. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing is uh, I know you know buying carbon offsets is yucky in a lot of ways, right? It's it's a license to pollute. But you know I finally put my you know started putting money into that, and especially when I've got airline airplane flights, which uh, you know a single flight basically doubles my footprint per the year. <laughs> right, uh, but you, you can know. check. People were concerned. I know a few yeah. years back I had that conversation with friends and relatives, yeah. and they were saying, well, you have no idea 
whether this organization you're sending money to actually does what they say they're well, going to do. But there it turns out that there are some really yeah, good monitoring organizations. There are, yeah, yeah, the Gold Standard and a few others. And and I also have to admit, you know, I'm I'm coming to this from a position of privilege that I have the disposable income to throw at this increased cost. Indeed. Um, but hey, you know, it's it's a thing I can do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What about th- you, Dave? Well, I think it's really important to show up and yeah. be part of things. So a couple of weeks ago, I was at a listening session in Winthrop, which yeah. is near Logan Airport, in which a state senator who's been really instrumental over the last 10, 12 years in pushing uh, climate uh, favorable legislation in the state of Massachusetts. And it was really encouraging to hear the testimony of a lot of regular citizens representing a lot of different viewpoints, as well as a ga- oil and gas a representative, just to hear what he had to say. So showing up, I think, matters to yeah. pick those events and show up, whether it's at the state house or your local climate action group in whatever community you live in or whatever. Yeah. So Good. I want a final anecdote on the nature of power. <laughs> <laughs> do you have something in mind, Rajesh? Yes, I do. Uh, I, I don't know if you remember or know this. You know, there was a very famous... Congress of the Soviet Communist Party, I think in 1956, when Khrushchev denounced Stalin. Like for the first time, he publicly acknowledged the excesses of the Stalin era. And so someone in the audience shouted like, why are you doing this now? You know, why didn't you, you? why, (laughs) where, where were you when it was actually happening? Why didn't you speak up? And Khrushchev says, who is it who's saying this? Total silence. Yeah. Come on, tell me who has the who has this question? Total silence. Now you understand why I didn't speak up either. <laughs> so it, it can uh, it can hurt exactly. <laughs> to speak up. Yeah. And and I think that my biggest problem with the term stakeholder is that often even the people who are term stakeholders, if they're too afraid to speak up, it doesn't really matter whether they're called stakeholders or not. All righty. Well, uh, I'm still thinking about the G20 meeting that mm-hmm. finished uh, this last weekend in Hamburg, Germany. And there are all the political power brokers for the top 20 countries across the world. And yet they were able to be real clear about their differences. And the 19 out of the 20 united in saying that the Paris Climate Accord was not negotiable, that it was something that they all agreed on, and they acknowledged the difference that was in the room, particularly President Trump of the United States, and they're moving on without the United States. So even in those cases where the power positions are really clear, folks are nonetheless acknowledging the difference and um, moving forward. I think that's progress for sure. What I don't know, and we have absolutely no way of predicting is, What's going to happen because 19 out of 20 are on the table while the 20th is not? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's quite interesting. Well, there, I think uh, China, Europe, maybe India are all promoting aggressively renewable energy in their and various countries. Out of one side of their mouth and out of the other side, they are, you know, China, for instance, yes. is, is, coal is coal building plants. coal plants all over the rest of the world. Right. Yeah. It's true. There are a lot yeah. of contradictions there. They're also so, aiming to be a leader in uh, EV and electric yeah. vehicle well, it, production. It too. goes back to the uh, we need some of the data, too. Exactly. Just because I say I got green energy doesn't mean yeah. we've solved the problem. It's true. In, yeah. in India, yeah. uh, building uh, coal, mining coal, importing yeah. coal. This is yeah. Vigilance. Vigilance is required. You know, yeah. The price of liberty is eternal vigilance or yeah. something like that. So, yeah, I just have a, a, a final thought about about power and its and its relationship to all of these all these kind of uh, things that watching the 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 US national environmental framework being systematically dismantled just points out to me how how fragile coming to these sort of agreed seemingly positive directions can be and that and that how how easy it is for a shift in power um, that is uh, that is ill-advised <laughs> can 
can dismantle this stuff. And so it that definitely motivates me. If it's not keeping me awake at night, it's getting me out of bed in the morning to, right. uh, to take this on. Right, and look at how the state, at least in the United States, the states and cities are taking leadership positions. Jerry Brown, the governor of California, is convening an international meeting around climate action. Yeah. So, Supreme Court, there's a lot of stuff that's coming your way. <laughs> Let's see how this plans out. Yeah, yeah that's indeed. for sure. Yeah, the challenges right. are in the courts. Yeah. Well, with that thought, <laughs> I think we had a pretty lively conversation. How's that? Yeah. Right? Uh, here, here. That's fair to say. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we invite you to uh, join the conversation. Uh, visit us on the web at climatex.mit.edu. Reach out to us through the feedback in that, uh, in that system or through any of our social media feeds. And we really look forward to hearing your thoughts on what you've heard here, any of the other resources that we've got on the site. Indeed. And feel free to post a uh, comment on any of the topics that we've got related to climate change on the website and or make a comment on an existing post, whatever. We'd love to have you jump into the conversation. Indeed. Well, with that thought, we're signing off. Farewell. Take care. Goodbye. Until the next time. Climate Conversations is brought to you by MIT's ClimateX, an online community dedicated solving the climate crisis. Visit us at climatex.mit.edu and join the conversation.